I don't actually have to ask him to reserve one for me. He actually told me he's going to prepare one for me. We just got to go get it. He wants us to have it. As a matter of fact, he showed us how much he loves us. And that he laid down his life for his friends. Now, will the friends lay down their lives for him? It is available. He wants us to have it. God would not go through what he went through if he wasn't real about us. We just got to make sure we real about him. The same love that he manifested to us, he, exact, he actually requires it to be reciprocated. Love me the same way I love you. And if you do that for me, as I've done for you, where I am, you will definitely be. Not, not something to look forward to? Is that not a reason to, to sell out for Jesus? The Jesus in his parables in 1345 of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who was seeking fine pearls. And when he found one, he sold all that he had to come back and buy that pearl. I believe that's the kingdoms of heaven's pursuit of humanity. God is God came looking for that value, that invaluable, priceless treasure that he calls a human. And he was willing to give everything that he had so that he may get me. I don't know about you, but that speaks volumes. But in that same chapter in 44, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who saw treasure in the field. That seems to be the pursuit of the man. The man is in pursuit of the kingdom while the kingdom is in pursuit of the man. You see the mutual pursuit. Both God and the human are in pursuit of one another. At some point in time, they will meet. And they will be in communion and that eternally. Is that not something to look forward to? You rise up in the morning, you're grateful to, to hear your wife still breathing, even though her breath may stink. <laughs> imagine <laughs> imagine waking up to Jesus every day good morning <sighs> welcome our visitors um, sister sister Lee has her sister with her And I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be rebuked for this, but Sister Love brought her friend out for the life of me. I can't recall her name, and I know I know it. Forgive me. <laughs> but we welcome her. She's been with us here on several occasions. So we, we welcome her with us. Let's, let's get to the matter at hand. I don't think there are any other visitors. Go with me to the book of Ephesians <clears throat> and the chapters 2. Go with me to the book of Ephesians, and the chapter is, is 2. <clears throat> We've been talking about the person of the Holy Spirit for the last couple weeks. First lesson in this particular focus of the, of the Holy Spirit as we discuss our theme, um, letting, letting Jesus draw you in 2022. And we're trying to set forth um, biblical, biblical lessons that, that actually show us how we draw nearer to him as he seeks to draw nearer to us. Let Jesus draw you in 2022. Jesus says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me, John 12, 32. So what we sought to do in, in, in talking about God and Christ, now the Spirit is, is shown, seeking to somewhat show in brevity how all of the three persons of the Godhead are functioning, seeking to aid us in getting closer to them. They actually desire to be closer to us and we to them, not just in distance, but also in identity. As a matter of fact, my, my identity is going to be connected with my distance. In other words, the more like God I am, the closer I am in distance to him. 
I am no more closer to God right now than I would be if he was right here. I am just as close to God right now. My, my geographical location does not determine how close I am to him. My identity determines that. Does that make sense? So right now, you and I are as close to God as we would be if he was here presently. Does that make sense? And so in the book of Ephesians, the chapter two, we want to talk more about this spirit as we leave this, leave this series of study dealing with the Godhead. Next week, we're starting, we're starting to talk about family and a cross-cultured family at that. Um, what type of family should we have? It's the type of family who is, who is actually built or rather have their foundation as Calvary. Calvary rather should be the family's foundation. The father and the mother and the children all should learn how to behave from Calvary. And if my house is not built on the foundation of the cross, my house is subject to fall apart. Because there's only one, one foundation that will stand, and that is the foundation of the cross. That's it. So, in the book of Ephesians chapter number 2, the verses that were read for you were verses 18 through 22. I want to read those. <clears throat> the text reads, and I'm reading from the ESV this morning. Now, I'm going to be reading two different translations because I know he has New American Standard on the board for me. That's fine. I use both and I read from both. And you can understand both. But in Ephesians 2, 218, 2.18, it says, For through him... We both have access by once or in one spirit or by one spirit to the Father. I want you to catch that. The Bible, we have access to the Father by the Spirit. Listen to the text. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, he says, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone or the chief cornerstone, if you're reading King James. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, he says, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by, by the Spirit. I want you to think with me on this subject this morning. Am I walking under the influence of the Spirit? Am I walking under the influence of the Spirit? Now, would you do yourself a favor and ask yourself that question? And ask myself, am I walking under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Have you asked yourself? Now, we're going to ask a few questions regarding the walking or living under his influence. And these are questions that I believe that the Apostle Paul actually gives us adequate answers. We have to determine whether or not we accept it. The book of Ephesians is, I want to be, just kind of want just to set a little context, is, is directed primarily to a Gentile audience a Gentile audience of, of people that at one point in time were not considered to be the people of God because they were not from the loins or from the lineage of Abram, i.e. Abraham. And so for a time in history, we know that God selected a particular body of people. He selected that, pe that particular body of people, not that he was neglecting all people, but he had certain parameters that he had to meet and that humanity needed. Humanity needed and God needed the appropriate kind of man that would be the kind of man that could justify God's name and also justify me. And so he selected a certain family and he would preserve a certain line, a certain lineage, a certain blood, because there was a certain type of man that he needed and I needed. As a matter of fact, everybody needed. And he would be 
that man so God was not neglecting the other nations when he chose the Jews. There was something specific that you and I and he needed. However, when we come to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians lets us know that that man that God needed and we needed has found himself on Calvary. Now all men, both Jew and Gentile alike, can have peace through the blood of the cross. Does that make sense? That's primarily the message. That's, the, that's what he's communicating to the Ephesians. Hey, everybody that, the, the two men as it used to be, what does he mean by two men? Jew and Gentile ethnicities. Those two men that were formerly in the old day and in the old time are no more. Because when God put Jesus on Calvary and he shed that blood, every human being has access to the same person, to the same place, and to the same, and to the same blood. That's Jesus, the cross, and his blood that God prepared for us from eternity. That makes sense? And so what he does, as we all know, is he brings all humans that obey Jesus into the same body. When Jesus is described in Ephesians 5 as being the Savior of the body, I want to be clear once again, that goes beyond a person hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. There is more to Jesus being the Savior of the body than me just initially obeying gospel and think I'm good. There's more to salvation than that. And because there is more to salvation than that, the Godhead has employed the Holy Spirit to do the finishing work. We all know that everybody that obeys gospel, Acts 5 and 32, Ephesians 1 and 14, everybody that obeys gospel receives the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Everybody. Everybody. And that is primarily because you are in the body of Christ where the Spirit operates. You, are, you live now in the body of Christ where the Spirit does his work. And so you, are now, you now can claim the indwelling of the Spirit because now you are in the body of Christ where Christ does his saving work by the Spirit through the gospel. Is this making sense? And so now I, I, I have access to divine power. I have access to a divine source that's going that that is adequate to help me and becoming the product that Yahweh needs for me to be and desires for me to be so I can live in that great city. I have to determine whether or not I'm under his influence. Make sense? Everybody good? Am I under the influence? Of the Spirit. We read in this chapter, in this text, that we have access by the Spirit to the Father. There in verse 18, you see that. Well, did not Jesus say he is the way to the Father? John 14, 6, he said that, right? He is. And that doesn't change. However, he has employed the Spirit to mold the man that will be coming into the presence of the Father. The Spirit is operating under the authority of the Christ. Remember in John 14, 16, 17, he says, I will send him, and he's going to guide. That's one work that he will be responsible for, but he will also be indwelling in every human. And every human that submits to the word of Christ will be the human that draws heaven to, it, to himself. We talked about this last week. And so, 
The spirit is the individual, is the person of the Godhead that is working in the life of the church and in the individual member of the body. Make sense? And so, but I want to know, am I under his, I know I'm a recipient of his indwelling because I am in the body of Christ. And he has a responsibility to make sure that he builds properly the vessel wherein God desires to dwell. However, what is my responsibility if there is any responsibility that I have? And if I have access to this divine power and his influence, is he influencing me? I want to look at a few things. Now, I won't ask a few questions and the lesson will be yours. I want you to go with me back to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Here is the first question. Here is the first question. How can I know if I am walking under the influence of the Spirit? Here's the first question I have. Am I controlled by my lust or my pleasures? Or rather, my lust and pleasures. That's, that's the first question. That's the first question. I, I'm going to present to you in the book of Ephesians at least two spirits. One is the Holy Spirit and another one is not. Both of them have influence. Don't, don't miss that. Please don't miss that. You got to catch that. There is a reason Paul goes on later to say we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There is a reason why he says that. Somebody is out to get you and me. And so he says in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, these are the words he communicates. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. What does he say? The spirit that now works in the sons of who? Disobedience. You see it? There's another spirit. Now, in a, in a few weeks, we're going to be talking about supernatural and, and look at the, 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 the spiritual realm here in just a few, few weeks, and we're going to discuss some of this in greater detail. But this is going to be on Thursday, 2 o'clock. So we're going to talk about, but I want to be clear that, that Paul says to the Gentile Christian that there was a time that you were under the influence of a spirit. What, what, what did you do? What did you do? He says, um, verse 3, among whom we also lived in the passions of our flesh. Listen to what he says carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Don't miss what he communicates. When I am operating under the spirit of the demonic realm, what I do is I carry out my lustful desires and pleasures. If I am carrying out my lustful desires and my pleasures, I am not under the influence of the Holy Spirit, but I am under the influence of the Spirit. That makes sense? That's clear? There are two spirits, at least two. At least two. Both spirits influence. Both of them do. One influences me to fulfill and satisfy my own lust and my own pleasure. If I am fulfilling my own lust and my own pleasures as it is implied by the Apostle Paul, I am not under the Spirit. I am not under the influence of the Holy Spirit, but I am under the influence of the Spirit. <laughs> that makes sense? So, first question. Now, I got a lot of stuff here. I'm not going to even go through all this. But, but here's, the first thing. here's the first thing I can ask myself. I ask, everybody asks themselves the question, am I under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Here's the question. Are you moved by your lust and your pleasures? If you are, the answer is no. You're not. Yeah, I, well, I'm in the body of Christ and the Spirit dwells in me. Yes, I agree. But as we've talked about in the previous two lessons, the, the spirit influences not the one who does not submit to his will. 
If he is moved by his own lust and his own pleasures, he is not influenced by the Spirit. Does that make sense? What you, what you move by. What you move by. And you can look at your own life and you can, you can, you can determine within yourself what makes you move. You can be honest with yourself. You got to be honest with you if you want to be what God wants you to be. So do I. And so I have to ask myself, what am I moved by? My lust and my pleasures are something else. See, what's interesting about this is that it, 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 King James says, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. New American Standard says, indulging in the desires. ESV says, carrying out the desires. That there, is, there, is a, there is a repetitiveness about this when I am walking under the influence of the demonic spirit. I keep doing it. I continue to do it. I don't stop doing it. This is why it is utterly dangerous to avoid listening to the message of Christ. And this is repeated repetitively throughout the book of Hebrews when he constantly warns the individual Christians not to walk away from the message of the Christ because it becomes dangerous when you walk away from his communication because you begin to carry out repetitively indulging and constantly fulfilling your lust and your pleasures and not his. Does that make sense? Everybody all right? Bring up 2 Corinthians 4, please. Paul communicates. And if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case, the God of this world, the, the God of this world, their, their, their spirit, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What is the spirit seeking to do? What is the God of this world seeking to do to the minds of humans? Blind them. What does he want you to do? Keep carrying out your lust. Keep fulfilling your pleasures. Why? Because that keeps you from seeing gospel. That keeps you from being saved. You know what the devil wants to do with every human being up in here? He's not concerned about taking your life. He wants your soul. He doesn't care if you die. He wants you to die lost. So as long as I can keep you blind as you undergo the human experience, I can keep you lost and fulfilling your lust and your pleasures. And I can keep you under my influence and not the Holy Spirit. That makes sense? Second question. Let's move on. <clears throat> let's go to Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Ephesians 3. 14 through 19. I want you to see, I want you to see, see the complete opposite. The complete opposite of what we just read in Ephesians 2. Complete opposite. Polar opposite. <clears throat> in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, I'm sorry. Ephesians 3, 14 and following. He says, and for this reason, let me give you my question. Let me give you a question. We're going to read the text. Am I maturing in my knowledge of Christ and increasing in the divine traits? Let me ask that again. Am, uh, am I maturing in my knowledge of Christ and increasing in divine traits? See, see, one spirit leads me into father and father rebellion. But there is another spirit that leads me closer to divine identity. These spirits are opposed to one another. One leads me into father death and decadence. One delivers me to the divine nature. Watch the text. Verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the father whom every family, this is 314, in heaven and on earth. 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Verse 16 says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being or inner man. How does God does to do the strengthening? What, what did I say earlier? God has employed the spirit to work in the body. He indwells in us and he works within us. Now, I want you to see what he does. Now, we, we know the spirit that God employs. That's the Holy Spirit. He employs him to work in my inner man so that I may be strengthened and fortified. Watch what he does. Watch what he does. He says, with power through his spirit in your inner being, verse 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, watch him, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see the progression? One spirit leads you further into your own pleasure. Another spirit leads you further to God, or rather, it leads you to a place where there can be more God in you. You see that? One spirit pulls me away from God, giving me more of what I love. Another spirit pull, pulls me away from my pleasures, putting more God in me. You see that? That makes sense? Y'all see that in the text? It's right there in the text. One spirit has two spirits. You, can, you and I can surrender to one of two. If I'm fulfilling my pleasures, that's one spirit. If I'm maturing in Christ, that's another spirit. Now, question, am I maturing in Christ? Have I, do I have more divine traits today than I had this time last year? Am I more godly now than I was last year? Am I closer to God now than I was last year? I'm not talking about in geography. I'm talking about identity. See, the Spirit does all this for me when I'm under his influence. He aids me in drawing closer. Am I closer? That's the question I have to ask. Now, I just can't answer, I can't answer that question based off my feelings. I got to use biblical facts. Because now I need to know what it is to be a Christian. And being a Christian doesn't mean you just only in the church. I would argue that's not Christianity at all. Looking at everybody. Am I, am I under the influence of the Spirit? That's the question. Am I under his influence? But, but you, see, you, you see the contrast between the two? One Spirit pulls one direction, another pulls another direction. Now, you've got to determine where, where am I being pulled. Next question. Am I concerned? Here's, an, here's this something else Paul brings out in this day. We're going to deal with it. Am I concerned with the building of the body? This is another indication as to whether or not I am, I am filled, I am under the influence of the Spirit. When I'm, when I'm pulled by my lust, I don't care about the body. I don't care about the edifying and building it up when I'm pulled by my lust. But when I'm pulled by the Spirit, I want to do everything I can to fortify the body. But when the Spirit pulls me, I'm concerned about the body. When another, when, that's the Holy Spirit, when another Spirit pulls me, I am not at all concerned about the body. See, what I learned in chapter 2 is that the Holy Spirit is in the process of actively building something. And he's building, essentially, humans on the chief cornerstone, and that's the Christ. And everything that's built on the chief cornerstone has to match 
the identity of the chief cornerstone. And so what the Spirit is doing, under the influence of the Christ who gave the gospel, everybody that listens to the mind of Christ becomes everything Christ is, and he can be put on the chief cornerstone that's being built as this habitation for God to come take his residence. Remember when God told Moses in Exodus 25, I won't go there, and I didn't give Brother Joe these texts. In Exodus 25, he told Moses in the mountain, see that you build all things according to the pattern. Y'all remember that? 25 and 26, he deals with that. Moses, whatever I told you about the building of the tabernacle, because I'm going to dwell there. You do it just like I said do it. Now, we can go to Exodus 40, which we will not. I give it to you. You can start in Exodus 40, 16 and read through the, last, read through the entire book, through the last, that last portion, and you can read where the narrator narrates how Moses did everything God told him to do. And after that, who came? God came. Because Moses did it the way God said do it. And he employed people to be involved in the building. What are you saying, Jesus? Moses is not building something the Spirit is. And he's building, building it at my word. Yes, he dwells in you. But he also employs you. In chapter number four, go with me there to verse number 11. Ephesians 4 and verse number 11. Watch this. He's already argued in chapter, the earlier parts of chapter 1. He's, he, he, he says in, in verse number 3, be eager to maintain the unity of the body. What are, you, what are you talking about, the unity of the body? He just communicated in chapter number 2 that the Holy Spirit is building, building something. He's building something on the chief cornerstone. What is he doing? He's building humans that are fit for the dwelling of God. That's what he's building. And so humans have to conform to the builder's regulation. If the human doesn't conform to the builder's regulations, then he's not fit for the building. Does that make sense? And so Paul says to Christians who are part of this infrastructure, the body of Christ, he says you need to be sure that you are eager to maintain or keep intact what the, what, the, what, the, what the Spirit is building. What's my time? He says, primarily to Jews and Gentiles who are coming from different cultures into one body, into under one head. All these different backgrounds coming into the same body, there can be conflict. Because you got Jews coming in, you got Gentiles coming in from all over the world, different cultures, different ethnicities, different ideologies, Jesus says essentially, this is my body. And what I need you to do is recognize it's not your body. It's mine. What I need you to do when you come into mine is be humble, be meek, be gentle, be patient, be long-suffering, be eager, because my body needs to be built. And I need you to act accordingly so my body won't be in disarray. One thing the Spirit doesn't do is promote unity, I mean promote disunity. When you got conflict in the church, you can rest assured somebody's not under the influence of the Spirit. You can rest assured. And so it says in verse 11, Having confirmed the works of Jesus, how he came and he defeated, won the battle, and he gave gifts, he gave gifts to men, he says. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ. Listen to what he did. Listen to what he says. Evangelists and elders and teachers, you have a responsibility to, to ensure that those under your tutelage are being informed properly so they can be built up properly. 
to summarize what he said. That's your response. If you're going to be an evangelist, you're going to be a, a, an elder, you're going to be a deacon, if you're going to be a teacher, if you're going to be a leader in the body of Christ, your responsibility is make sure those under your tutelage are being equipped for ministry. That's your responsibility. That's not to say everybody going to submit to your tutelage. But that is to say that's your responsibility. Watch the text. Why, why, why? Because what are you concerned about, Jesus? Spiritual maturity. What do you mean spiritual maturity? I need everybody to ultimately come to the position where they look just like Jesus. You see that? It's in the text. Watch what he does. He says, so that we no longer be children tossed to and fro by the ways and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, it may be better to understand speaking the truth in love as living in love. It may be better to understand it that way. Not so much dealing with the communication, but dealing with the lifestyle. Walking in love may be the better way to understand that text. He says, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. He says, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What did you just say, brother? I'm sure. This was just, I didn't ask you my question. Yes, I did. Am I concerned with the building of the body? That was my question. Am I concerned with the building of the body? If I am, whatever I have to offer the body, I'm supposed to offer it. And if I'm not offering the body anything but my presence on Sunday, I am not giving the body my gift. I'm not. Your gift ain't assembly. Assembling is your responsibility. That's not your gift. Now you got to ask yourself the question, am, am, I, am I involved in the building of the body? Am I involved in the edification of the body? Am I at all concerned about the growth of the body? And if I'm not, how am I under the influence of the spirit when that's exactly what he's concerned about? Make sense? I'm trying to see who's listening. And who just said, it don't matter. L let, me, let me hurry up and close. I'm practicing on shortening my lesson so I can get you out of here at 1230 when we go back to Bible study. But I ask these questions and I'll close. Am I submitted to the brethren concerned about them being filled with the Spirit? I do want to read this text. Verse 18 of Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. He says, and do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. He says, addressing or speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with, uh, with your heart to the Lord. He goes on to say, Always and for everything, giving thanks to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God and the Father. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Or submit to one another in fear. Now, Paul gave an order. And the order is, your translation say, be filled with the Spirit. Better translation may, be, may, may say, be filled by the Spirit. By the Spirit. He ends by saying, submitting to one another. So a part of my being filled is submitting to the brethren. Surrendering to the brethren's needs. I want you to get that. It is in this text he talks about the reciprocity of singing. 
We argue for no instruments. What Paul is talking about is being filled with the Spirit. And he gives order as to how that it should be done. That is done when brethren come together in collectives of assemblies and they're speaking to one another the law of God, whether it be through psalms, hymns, and spiritual song, or through study, giving thanks to the glory and the grace of God. How is the body fortified? When, and how are the people filled with the Spirit when brethren within the body submit themselves to their brother and they take the pleasure of being in the assembly, making sure everybody is informed, whether it be through song or through word? That's what he means. So, Am I submitted to the brethren? Am I concerned about the brethren's well-being? Paul tells me how it should be done. It's in assemblies. When we are together, singing and informing one another by the ways of God. That's how we are fortified and built. That's how we grow. You're not designed to grow alone. And if you believe you can, you don't know Bible. Nobody studies the Bible and concludes that I'm able to grow by myself. Nobody. You're not studying Bible. You're studying something else. Challenge that if you don't believe it. Nobody comes to that conclusion that understands Bible. You come to that conclusion when you're drawn away by your own lust and entice. But nobody reads Bible and say I can do Christianity or Judaism by myself. It's never been a one-man show. If it was a one-man show, it was Jesus' show, and he chose 12 men. Am I submitted to my brethren? Am I concerned about them being filled? If I, I, I do, I am if I'm under the influence of the Spirit. I'm concerned about my brother's well-being if I'm under the influence of the Spirit, and I'm willing to do whatever the Bible tells me I need to do for their building up, whatever that may be. My gift, here it is. My time, here it is. My sacrifice, here it is. Because that's what the Lord said needs to be done for the building up of the body. Are we concerned about building what the Spirit is building? I won't develop these, but I'll give them to you. Am I behaving like the Gentiles? Ephesians 4.17 No longer walk as Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, in their ignorance. You can't be under the influence of the Spirit and be ignorant of the Spirit. You can't be. It's interesting to me, and I don't mean any harm by saying this, but it's always interesting to me. The people that don't want Bible study is the, oftentimes the one needed the most. Am I still walking in impurities? Ephesians 5, 3 and following. Again, I'm not going to develop these because I'm coming to a conclusion. But I do want you to look at verse 4, chapter 4, verse 30. And I close with this thought. Having told them that the Spirit is building something, He's building something, and you got part of it, do your part. He talks about their gifts, but then in 417 and following, or rather 417 through 521, he talks about behavior. And in chapter 4, and sandwiched in the midst of this, having told them the Spirit is in the process of building something, and it's you. You have a part in this building. You give your gift to the body, but also make sure your behavior is right. In sandwiched in this, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What do you mean? When I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I frustrate him. 
When I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I frustrate him. I have a responsibility to the body when I'm, man, I'm, oh well, God knows my heart. I know I'm not behaving right well, you know, God, you know I'm human. I know this, I know the community of Christ needs me, but you know what, I got better things to do. And all of that grieves him. Because the more he pulls on your shoulder, the more he says, I'm not, and the more you say, I'm not concerned about it. More he pulls. More he pulls. You, I, I, I tell people, that I can sit here and look at, look at you all, and I can tell when the light bulb goes off. I can tell. I can look at your facial expression. You say, oh, man, I, that just hit me. But then walk right out that door. And he keeps pulling you, and you don't listen, and you frustrate him, and eventually he's going to let you go. Am I under the influence of the Spirit? That's the question. And I'm done. If you're here with us this morning, have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and have him come into his body with all this all this power is and the access to God, the access to the spirit that is willing to aid me to be whatever, be whatever, everything that God would have me to be. It is, it, is, it is in the body of Christ. I come to Jesus by hearing the good news, hearing that gospel, hearing what he did for me, believing that, being willing to repent because of what he's done, not because of what I've done, but because of what he did. It was not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. When his kindness and goodness appeared to us, we should move in the direction of him. Titus 3, 4, 5, and 6. So that we may be renewed and regenerated by the spirit that he calls to dwell in us. That's what we're supposed to do. My saving involves my complete sanctification and purification. If I am not yet a mature vessel that is an image of Christ, I am not done. I am not done. What I need to do is whatever I need to do to make sure I am under the influence of the Spirit so I can be filled by Him and with Him. So we leave. So I obey Jesus by hearing that gospel, repenting, and being baptized with Him in the water of baptism for the remission of my sins. However, if I have made that commitment to Him at some point in time, I made that covenant. But I recognize, you know, you gave the Spirit your order. You gave him the instructions to build me, and I have been rejected. I have been under the influence of a spirit, but it's not been the Holy Spirit. And I want to change my influencer. I want to be influenced by the one that you have employed to influence in your body. And I want to be controlled and governed and pulled by him. Help me come home. Where do you stand? Consider your soul in this salvation as we stand.